David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Abijah. And Abijah was the father of Asa. Matthew 1, 6 and 7. Now, some of those names might sound familiar to a few of you. David, anyone recognize him? What about Solomon? Now, the Bible scholars among you, do you recognize Uriah? Rehoboam? I'm willing to bet that a lot of you don't recognize Asa, but maybe a few of you do. In fact, he gets more chapters in the Bible than the vast majority of figures who show up do. He has four entire chapters devoted to him, one in the book of 1 Kings and three in 2 Chronicles. But I'll admit, as we were reading through the genealogy of Jesus and Matthew, Bryce and I and Brandy together, and we were planning out worship services and trying to figure out what the sermons were going to look like and doing all of that, we read that name, and for some reason I thought, I'm going to look this guy up because I can't remember what on earth he did. Now, I have read the Bible from cover to cover. That is not bragging. That's kind of the bare minimum you have to do when you have my job, you know? But I could not remember this guy's name. I did not know what he was, and I knew from the genealogy that obviously he's a descendant of David and a descendant of Solomon. He's an ancestor of Jesus, but why include him? Who was he? What did he do? And so I went and I read his story in 1 Kings. Honestly, because we were trying to plan out the entire sermon series that afternoon, and I looked at the two passages where he showed up, and I went, hey, that one's shorter. (laughs) Save us a little bit of time while we're planning. I went and read it, and I went, this dude is amazing. He's amazing. He got rid of idol worship in the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, after the kingdom had split in half. He, he led the people in war and had victory because God had blessed him. He was an amazing and peaceful king. He ruled for over 40 years, and he served God through his entire life. What an amazing story. Then I sat down this week, or last week rather, and began to read about King Asa in the book of Chronicles. And there's an interesting thing you'll notice if you read Kings and you read Chronicles. By the way, I refer to them as the Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles because originally there wasn't first and second, first and second. They were just one book each, the Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles. And the Book of Chronicles was written much later than the Book of Kings. It was written after the people had left. They had gone off to Babylon in exile. Their monarchy had been destroyed. Their national identity had been demolished. And they were led away to live in a foreign nation under the rule of pagans. They were being punished by God for their sin, for their idolatry. And they came back, and they're looking back at their records, at books like the Book of Kings, and like the annals of the kings of Judah and the annals of the kings of Israel. And they're they're realizing something that they have all these stories of these kings that they remember as these amazing figures. But some of their stories weren't quite so amazing. Some of their stories weren't quite so positive. Many of these kings began their rule so well, and towards the end of their reigns, they kind of started messing up. And in the book of Chronicles, you see people under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit looking back at their history and seeing all the places where their leaders had failed them. So when you read the book of Kings, you'll read about these amazing kings like Asa that do nothing wrong in their entire reign, and you'll read about them again in Chronicles, and you'll see the Holy Spirit saying, well, actually, these guys aren't as perfect as you might think they are. King Asa is one such person. He begins his reign strong, relying on the Lord, and towards the end of his reign, he fades. We are much the same way. So often in our lives, we begin strong. When it's early in our lives, it's easy for us to trust in God because we have no money, we have no idea what we're doing, and you don't really even know how to cook anything besides ramen when you get out of college or out of high school, right? Uh, you can't even half feed yourself. You can't take it. You don't own a house. You don't, it's hard to rely on yourself because yourself has nothing to offer. But as you get older, bank account gets a little bit safer. You pay off your mortgage. You own your own car becomes easier to rely on yourself. Maybe you get married, you have kids, and at first you panic because you don't know how to raise a small human, but once you get to your fourth kid, you're like, oh, they basically raise themselves. I'm not too worried about it anymore. (laughs) Just my parents? Okay, all right. And you see, when we're in situations in our lives where we refuse to rely on the Lord, we're a bit like this string. We may be strong. We can handle a surprising amount of stress. Y'all are a little tougher than you look. 
But the thing is, at some point, the stress just becomes too much. There's too much going on, and we break. And this is the story of King Asa, where he spends so much time at the end of his life, as we'll read in just a moment, relying only on his own strength, and eventually things break. But the thing is, with strings like this, is when they rely on one another, much like we are supposed to rely on the Lord, when they're bound together and woven together into a single string, they become much stronger. And the same is true with our lives. The same is true with Asa's life early in his reign, where when he relies on the Lord, he is unbreakable. So today, as we study the story of King Asa, I want you to keep that in mind, that when we rely on the Lord, we are like, as the scriptures say, a cord of three strands. Does that sound familiar? Relying on our brothers and sisters and on the Lord our God, we become unbreakable. But when we rely only on our own strength, sooner or later, we are bound to fail. We will be in first, or Second Chronicles, rather, chapters 14 through 15. I'm going to summarize a lot of the text because it's too much for us to sit down and read in one sitting, and I know you guys want to get to lunch at some point today. And I promise I'll get you out of here by 2.30. So we're going to be summarizing a lot of the text today, but we'll pause and we'll read parts of it. Uh, for your convenience, the text will be up on the screen whenever we stop to read. See, Asa takes over when his father Abijah dies. That's normally how kingdoms work. The king dies and the prince takes over. And the first thing that he does is he begins fortifying the fortified cities of Judah. This is just something that you would do back in the day. You see, you didn't have fortresses and military bases usually. You just had cities, and certain cities would have walls around them. That's what made a city a city instead of a town. It wasn't population. It was whether or not it had a wall. And he goes around to all these ears, these fortified cities, and he builds up their walls. He makes sure that they're manned. He makes sure that they're protected. That's what a good king does. And the land had peace for many years. Now notice, there's no mention of God yet. God hasn't really shown up in this story, but Asa is at least a smart king. He's protecting his nation. He's doing what he needs to do because he knows the neighbors around him, well, they don't like Judah very much. They don't like his kingdom. They'd like to see it destroyed. In fact, even their cousins to the north, the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, they want to see Judah destroyed as well. And so he protects his people. Asa is beginning on a good foot. But then there's a bit of a problem. You see, as we know today, peace never lasts forever. They knew that in the ancient world as well. And while they may have been expecting an attack from the north, rather the attack came from the south. There was a powerful empire in Africa known as Cush, modern-day Sudan, near Egypt. And they traveled up through Egypt. They traveled through the Arabian Peninsula to attack the kingdom of Judah. They thought it would be easy pickings because Judah, it was a powerful enough nation, but Cush It was unimaginably powerful. When this conflict is described in chapter 14 of 2 Chronicles, we're told the exact number of men that Israel has. We aren't even told how many soldiers the Cushites have. They have thousands upon thousands and 300 chariots. And that one kind of goes over our heads a bit. But in that day and age, you have to understand, a chariot was like a tank or like a stealth bomber. It was this unimaginable tool of destruction that a normal soldier had no hope of stopping. So when we're told there was 300 chariots coming into Judah, and we're not told if Judah even had a single chariot, the message that we should get is they had no hope of winning. So Asa does the only thing he can. He drops to his knees. He calls out to God. Him and all of his soldiers, they cry out to God and ask for God to save them. And we are told very quickly that the army of Judah routed the Cushites, drove them off. They won the war and returned with much plunder. God saved his people. They were in an impossible circumstance. They had no chance of winning. And when they called out to God, God rescued them. What an amazing story! What an uplifting story! Here at United in Faith, we faced what many people outside of our church said was impossible circumstances. The first one of my mentors I went to and said, we're going to merge these churches. We're going to reunite two churches that split decades ago. He said, it's never happened in my 45-year ministry. You can't do it. Just give up. Impossible circumstances. I love the man to death, but he told me there was no way it was going to happen. Look at us today. 
because we had leaders that were willing to cry out to God, because we had members of our congregation who were willing to cry out to their Lord and Savior and ask for his power to do this impossible thing. And that's what King Asa did. And he had victory. What an amazing story. And Asa's story doesn't stop there. In fact, God sends a prophet to speak to him, and we read these words at the beginning of chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. In 2 Chronicles 15, 1 through 7, it says, The Spirit of God came on Azariah, son of Oded, and he went to meet King Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all of Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. In those days, it was not safe to travel about, for all the inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another, and one city by another, because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. And I want you to imagine for a moment that you're King Asa. And you've just won this amazing victory. You return to your capital city and people are laying down palm branches in the streets and cry out, King Asa, we love you. Will you sign my baby? (laughs) And you get back to your your palace. And this prophet walks up to you and says, I have a message for you from God. Your heart stops. What is God going to say to me? (laughs) And he says, you've done an amazing job. For so long, my people have rejected me. But now they're coming home. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep obeying. Keep listening. Keep relying on me. Seek me and you will find me and I will reward you. King Asa, he was on cloud nine. He was so excited. And we see it because of all the amazing things he does afterwards. Immediately, he begins removing idols that the people had worshipped since the time of Solomon or possibly even before. There was an altar in the temple to the Lord that had fallen into disrepair, and he fixes it. And finally, in the 15th year of his reign, he holds a massive festival to the Lord and he recommits the people to their covenant. They promise to worship only Yahweh and no other gods. They swear even on pain of death that the entire nation would serve one God and one God only. And still Asa isn't done. Like the cherry on top of the Sunday, he takes all the silver and gold that had been taken out of the temple through the reigns of his great-grandfather, his grandfather, and his father, and he returns all of it to its rightful place in the treasury of God's temple. What an amazing king. What a wonderful leader. A person totally sold out to serve God. And we're told this in the section that I just summarized. They sought God eagerly, and he was found by them. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. Sounds a lot like what Azariah just said, right? The Lord is with you and you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. And what do they do? They spend the next several decades of Asa's reign seeking after God eagerly, and God is found by them, and church, the same can still be done today. Seek God, and you will find him. Serve him, and he will reward you. And that reward, maybe it doesn't come in this life, but it will come. Asa sets such an amazing example for us through the first 35 years of his reign. But like so many of us, as time goes on, we learn to rely on our own strength. When we stack up successes in our job or in our families, in our personal lives, wherever, we start thinking that we can handle it by ourselves. And Asa, well, he's only human, and he does the exact same thing. In the 36th year of Asa's reign, Israel, the northern kingdom, finally gathered the men and the courage to attack Judah. And they have a massive army. Judah has no hope of winning by themselves. But we've seen this movie before, right? When the Cushites attacked from the south with a massive army that Judah had no hope of defeating, what did Asa do? He dropped down to his knees, he called out to the Lord his God, and God saved him. So what do you think he does this time? 
Not that. No, Asa does what we do so often. He says, I can handle this myself. And we read about it in chapter 16. Asa took the silver and the gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's temple and of his own palace and sent it to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram. This is a nation north of Israel who was ruling in Damascus. Let there be a treaty between me and you, he said, as there was between my father and your father. See, I am sending you silver and gold. Now break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so he will withdraw from me. Let me break down what's happening here. King Asa, rather than crying out to God, asking for God to save him, he says, I know what I can do. I'll go to another king and I'll bribe him. I'll go to an ally of Israel, the nation that is attacking me, and I will bribe him to attack from the north. And if I'm attacking from the south and they're attacking from the north and Israel's caught in the middle, we'll win this war. And it works. It works. He goes and he pays off this king, and they attack from both directions. They defeat the nation of Israel, and again, Asa returns victorious from war with plenty of plunder to spare. And all is well that ends well, right? But there's a detail in there, one that should stick out to you. He doesn't just take the gold from his own palace. He doesn't ask God what to do first. He goes in without God's permission into God's own holy temple and takes all the money out of the treasury and goes and uses it for his own purposes, to save his own skin. Rather than trust in the Lord, he steals from him. Do you think this is going to end well? So yeah, Asa wins the war with the help of the kingdom of Aram. The plan works, but God isn't very happy about it. Because Asa learned a lesson early in his life that he forgot. He learned that if you rely on God, like a rope made of so many strands, you will be unbreakable, undefeatable, that God will always have his way. But rather, he reverted. He lost his faith. He lost that lesson. He became like the one string that was so easily broken. And God sends a prophet to him to correct him. Hanani, a seer, comes to him in verse 7. And says this, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped your hand. Were not the Cushites and the Libyans a mighty army with great numbers of chariots and horsemen? And yet, when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the entire earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. Hanani reminds him of the exact same thing that I mentioned a moment ago, the exact same thing that the author of the text, that the Holy Spirit who spoke through him, wants you to notice, that Asa has been in this situation before, relied on the, on the Lord, and everything turned out well, but when he forgot that lesson, when he trusted only in his own strength, he wronged God. And not only did he hurt himself, he hurts his entire nation. Because when a nation goes to war, it's not just the king that suffers. In fact, the king probably suffers less than anyone else. It's the common people From the lowest of the low to the highest of the high, everyone in the nation suffers when the nation goes to war. So when the king misbehaves, the entire nation of Judah suffers, and sin is always that way. When each one of us sins, we may think it's private, we may think we're only hurting ourselves, we may think it's innocent and it's hurting no one at all, but the reality is sin hurts everyone around us. It harms our families, our communities, and our congregations. There is no one who escapes its touch, even if we don't notice it. And so when the king sins, or when we sin today, everyone around him is harmed. The nation will be at war. But there's another detail so easy to read over, and it's the name of the prophet that's sent to him. Hanani? This name comes up in a few different forms throughout the Bible. In the New Testament, there are men named this. The name's rendered Ananias, like the guy who heals Paul's sight after he's struck blind. In the Old Testament, sometimes it shows up like this, but more often it's spelled Hananiah. And the name means God is gracious. Last week, Bryce reminded us, or Bryce taught many of us for the first time, that names in the Old Testament sometimes tell you a lot about the story. And this is one of those cases. Hananiah, God is gracious. This prophet comes to the king and says, you have done wrong and God will punish you, but his name is God is gracious. 
When we read the Old Testament, we see over and over again that a prophet will come to God's people or come to a foreign people in judgment. Jonah comes to the city of Nineveh and promises them they're going to be destroyed. He gives them no hope of repentance, and God didn't tell him to. But when they repent, when they say, God, we are sorry that we have wronged you, God forgives them, and he doesn't punish them, because God is gracious. If Asa knew his Old Testament, if he read the story of Jonah, if he even knew the name of the prophet that came to him, this reminder, God is gracious. It's like God is whispering to him, hey, Asa, I know you've done wrong and you deserve to be punished, but I'm gracious. If you just repent, I'm gracious, I'll forgive you. Remember, Asa, I am gracious. I will forgive. Just repent. What do you think Asa does? I wish I could tell you that he covered himself in sackcloth and ashes and he cried out to the Lord and the Lord forgave him. That's not what happens. As we read in the very next verse, Asa was angry with the seer because of this. He was so enraged that he put him in prison. And at that same time, Asa brutally oppressed some of the people. And while it's easy to demonize Asa here, remember, again, we are so often like this. When we are confronted with our own sin, with our own wrongdoing, it is rare that we repent. Often we double down. We swear, I'm not the one who has a problem, you are. Well, I wouldn't act this way if you didn't, whatever. We blame others, we lash out, we get angry, we refuse to repent. Every single one of us who has been in the church for any length of time has seen someone at one point of our life in one congregation or another who has done wrong against their community or against a different member of the congregation, against an elder or against a pastor, or a pastor who's done wrong to the congregation. And when they're confronted with their sin, they blame everyone else and they leave rather than accept responsibility for what they've done. Every single one of us has seen this story. If you haven't seen it in a church, you've seen it in your family, or at work, or with your friends. When we're confronted with our own sin, we don't repent. More often than not, we lash out. But God is sitting there, whispering to you, if you'll just say, I'm sorry, if you'll just try to do better, I am gracious and I will forgive you. Ultimately, Asa's story is a disappointing one. He starts off so well, trusting in the Lord. He is unbreakable. He is undefeatable. And at the end of his life, he trusts only in himself. We're told, if you finish reading his story in the next few verses, that he gets a disease of the feet, he never asks God to heal him, and then he dies after reigning for 41 years. That's the end of his story. I think there's a warning in Asa's story. Uh, Equal parts a warning and an encouragement. We see both sides of the equation. What does your life look like when you trust in God? And what does life look like when you rely only on yourself? Which part of Asa's life would you rather live? Would you like to be like him early in his life? When he relied on his God and his God delivered him? Or would you want to be like him late in his life? Where he rejected the Lord, lashed out at anyone who tried to correct him, and died alone. The decision is ours to make. But whatever side of Ace's life you look at, there is one core lesson that rings out. One core instruction, one commandment we can see through the story, and it's simple. We should trust in the true God in all circumstances, in every area of our lives, because there's so many areas where we refuse to. For some of us, we refuse to trust God with the direction that our country is headed. It feels like... Every generation has had their, this country is going to heck in a handbasket moment, right? Or a handful of them. Or a handbasket full of them. The wrong president gets elected, the wrong Supreme Court justice gets put on the court. Whatever happens, we have this moment where we feel like this country is irredeemable, that God's abandoned it. Well, everyone's always felt that way, and somehow the country is still here, so take some comfort in that. But beyond that, did you know that God is bigger than our president? Bigger than the Supreme Court? Bigger than Congress? Did you know that God is in control even when we feel like we are not? Did you know that God is bigger than the United States? He is. So can you trust in the true God when it comes to the direction of our country, to politics, 
How can you tell if you are? Well, let me ask at least one example, one question that may, may move your head in the right direction. How do I know if I'm trusting in the true God when it comes to the direction of our country? Well, uh, when's the last time you prayed for it? When's the last time you prayed for our president or vice president or a member of our Supreme Court or our representative in Senate or in, or in the House of Representatives? When's the last time you prayed for them by name? I'll admit it's been a long time since I have. Probably the last time I did was the last time someone told me I should, to be honest with you. But if you want to trust God with the direction of our country, if you spend so much time worrying about it and posting on Facebook about it and complaining to your kids or your parents or your spouse about it, why don't we take a minute to trust God with it? Why don't we pray? Ask for him to interfere. I don't know if he will or not. Maybe the country's headed the exact direction he wants it to for one reason or another. But I know that we're supposed to pray, rely on the Lord, do what Asa refused to do at the end of his life. Now, I don't have any kids, but many of you guys do. I just saw them all storm out of here, flood of humanity. I might be a father one day. Maybe I won't. I don't know. I don't know what's in store for me. But talking to my parents, now that I'm an adult and they're a little bit more honest about what it was like to raise me, <laughs> it was not easy. <laughs> I don't think it was easy to raise any of my three siblings either. Parenthood is always difficult. And there are things that you guys worry about, isn't there? What kind of world are they going to inherit? Are they going to make good grades? When they go off to middle school, are they going to be bullied because they don't know the kids there? Because we don't live in the right neighborhood or make enough money? When they go to college, are they going to keep going to church? Do they really believe in Jesus or do they just go because I tell them they have to? When I read the Bible, do they understand any of it? When it's time for them to get their first job, are they going to get a good one where their boss treats them well and where they're paid fairly, or are they going to be treated poorly? Are they going to know when it's time to leave a relationship when they aren't being treated the way they deserve to be treated? You guys worry about that, don't you? And there's so much of it that you can't control, and that's terrifying. But we all know someone who can, who can interfere, who can be that still small voice that whispers in their ear even when they won't talk to you because they're mad that you grounded them. We know a God who can step in in any circumstance, who can guide your children on the right paths. And I'm not saying that if you pray hard enough that I'm promising that all your kids are going to stay Christian and have terrific jobs. That is not what the Bible teaches. But the reality is we have a God who can step in when we cannot. But when's the last time that we prayed for our kids? Our grandkids? For our nieces? our nephews. Do you pray for them every night? At least a few times a week? If not, you should. Because there's no more powerful tool you have in your parenting toolbox. Some of you, you have health issues. Or your mother or your father do. Your spouse does. And you've had to think a little bit more than you've wanted to recently about what life's going to be like. When you're gone, are they going to be okay without you? What life's going to be like when they're gone? Are you going to be okay without your mom? Without your husband? The thing is, we know a God who's still going to be here when all of us are gone from this life and waiting happily for the next one. We know a God who can take care of our kids when we're long gone. We know a God who can comfort our spouse if we pass away early. We know a God who can fill the void left when our father or our mother leaves this world and we don't know what to do without mom or dad. We know a God who can do that. But when's the last time that we asked him for comfort? When we prayed that, Lord, I know, I know my family member doesn't have long left. I don't know if they have a few weeks, a few months, or a few years. But God, will you comfort me? Will you be there for me? Will you take care of me when they're gone? Have you prayed that prayer? Have you decided to rely on God? Trust in the true God. Do what Asa couldn't at the end of his life. Put all of your faith in the one who is strong enough to do all things. And then even when things are difficult, when he doesn't do things your way, when he doesn't do things as quickly as you think he should, when he doesn't make things as easy as you wish he would, keep trusting. Trust in the true God. Don't do it by yourself. I want to end today by praying a psalm over you. Psalm 31, not the entire psalm, but part of it, I think speaks very well 
to the subject that we've been covering today. I wonder if it's a psalm that Jesus prayed when he spent time alone in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. It's a psalm of trust, a psalm declaring to God that we will rely on him in any circumstances. So let's take a moment and let's pray this psalm. Let's promise God that we are going to trust him, that we know that he is all-powerful. Would you pray with me? By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars, and he puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it has stood firm. But we wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Lord, Help us to trust you. Help us to emulate King Asa early in his reign when he knew nothing but to call out to you. When he stood on that battlefield against impossible odds and he said, God, you are my only hope. Help us to be like that. Help us to do wonderful things in your name with the power that you have given us by the Holy Spirit, the example you have given us by the Son. God, help us to be more like you. God, when doubt creeps in or when we are tempted to rely on ourselves and think we can do things by ourselves, remind us that we can do nothing apart from you. Lord, call us back time and time again to the story of King Asa and to Psalm 33. Help us to renew our trust in you and rely on you only. God, help us to trust in the true God who will never let us down. In Jesus' name, for your kingdom and for your church, we pray. Amen. Thank you, God.